who you've met uh, to give me some jokes because I have very little jokes and I've heard, it, I've heard it said that he usually started with something interesting, uh, something colorful, and so I promise I'll have some coffee with him this week. And but it is good to be back, it is good to see you, it is a gift to be here and it's a treat to see you all and pray with you all. It is a gift to be back. We spent a month working in the Diocese of Hawaii on the Big Island. And we served at St. Jude's Episcopal Church, a place that is at the end of the world, which has made me come back and celebrate that I have the gift of the Growers, growers Direct and Sprouts and lattes down the street. And it made me remember when I spent 12 days on the res a long time ago in South Dakota. Yes, I sometimes have these romantic dreams with my wonderful, amazing wife and we go, you know, we should just get off the grid, go to an island, and we, you know, get off devices, I should put my iPhone away, and this month I was reminded, actually, not so much. <laughs> it is good to be back. And I love the people of St. Jude's. Don't get me wrong, but man, when the first, when the closest beach is 30 miles away, there's no cell network, there's no Wi Fi. Are we there yet? I need another snack. There's no Ralphs. Where's the party? I don't know. Ooh, it's good to be home. So I embrace the traffic. And I embrace the wonderful gift of today's scripture, especially. Because in a strange way, we're celebrating the gift of the Transfiguration, which historically, or at least most times, usually comes Epiphany, Lent time. But what a wonderful providential moment that we celebrate the Transfiguration. And I know at least most preaching I've heard has been the classic, you know, the mountaintop experience, but we have to go down into the valley and uh, uh, moralism almost. What, what strikes me instead this morning on this gift of the transfiguration is the affirmation of Jesus' identity. A fancy word in the church, Christology, how we understand the identity of Jesus. And what excites me even more is that this identity shines out on this mountaintop. And the next shining we will see is this holy candlestick on Calvary, the cross, shining out into the world. And when you read the history of St. Mary's in a plastic folder somewhere hidden in the Rose Cottage, there's this interesting sentence in this paragraph when Bishop Stevens consecrated this building and called it St. Mary's. Um, in 1929, how there's a, there's a lighted cross somewhere, that was the vision at least, for this lit cross to shine out into the community, touching the ocean, touching everything around here geographically. Because at that time when we see the pictures, there was really not, there was a thousand people according to Laguna Life, I think, <laughs> newspaper at the time. But what a wonderful reminder about identity in this celebration of the transfiguration, this light shining forth from Jesus of Nazareth, affirming his glory, who he is, his essence, his being, and the voice of the divine, behold my son. And I, I, it was interesting for me this week, praying about this because it affirmed culturally, I understood better why we talk about Father Son. I learned that there was a time that when women gave birth, they were treated as just carriers of the child. I mean, now there's the gift of knowing genetic connection, DNA contribution of the mother, but at, at a time, it was the father and the son, and the inseparableness of those two. The woman were just merely carriers of this child. And I give thanks to God for post-modernity, post because now we know 
you know, 50%, and so when it's the good stuff is in Jonah, I hope he's not here, I'm picking on him. It's all his mom, and when it's little dodgy stuff, I know it's me. So, but that being said, what a wonderful reminder about identity. What a wonderful invitation for us at Tim Man. And my challenge to you, my invitation to you on your faith journey, are you willing to reveal yourself in this community? Are you willing to share who you are in this community? And I'm just curious, I want to really get to know you. I've been here a year now, and I would really like to get to know you. And that's the wonderful invitation that I'm hearing that moves me from the mountaintop transfiguration experience, identity. Our Lord knows what's coming in Jerusalem. And He affirms, this is who I am. What a challenge in a society that struggles to try to define who you are and who I am. Whether we like it or not, we live in, in machines of production. Just walk through any more. And I see how, I mean, there are all these intentional stores that are trying to define me. And I know Apple does a great job defining me <laughs> with all the gadgets that they have. And so, what a wonderful opportunity for places of faith to affirm what does it mean to be countercultural? I will not have a product define who I am. I will have the life of Jesus define who I am. I will have this rabbi who lived in a particular time, in a particular place, not from the planet Krypton, but was born of Mary. The God-bearer, as the Orthodox brothers and sisters would say. The name of this place. Saint Mary. The God-bearer. How might we bear God to this community? How might we embody the divine economy, the sharing economy, the kingdom? to our community, to our homes, to our families. So I'm curious. In your hearing of, in your historical experience of transfiguration, where in your life is transfiguration taking place? Where in your life is transformation taking place? I know, I feel the Spirit moving at St. Mary. I feel the Spirit moving in Orange County. And even when the Spirit's definitely moving amongst the Episcopal churches. Because before I went on vacation, we have a deanery, right? Well, it's the, it's the deanery. Uh, I'm, Will's going to correct my language because I sometimes forget how we classify our geographical locations, but we all have deaneries. And my passion is how will our Episcopal presence ooze into our communities? Because we've been spending a lot of time fighting with one another. As just as the, maybe it's just me, I don't know. But it feels like there's just been a lot of tension and fighting. And there's nothing like reminding what does it mean to be community, living off the grid for a month where you don't have a choice but to live together. Because there's no water, food is expensive, and you have to figure out how to live together and work through cultural differences, work through ethnic differences, work through language differences. Even though there is a profound historical narrative of pain that exists there. And so what a wonderful reminder for me in my own prayers, because do we notice Jesus goes up to the mountain top to do what? To pray. The Spirit, I feel Jesus challenges me in my own spirituality. 
Have you become comfortable, Lester? Have you forgotten how scandalous it's, my ministry has been? Or have you become comfortable with your latte and your... Again, this is just me. This is just what has happened in my own prayer life. Have I become comfortable? Or have I forgotten what Jesus of Nazareth stood for? The essence of his being, his Christology, his identity, rooted in love. Love neighbor, love God, love self. So for you this week, for this August, as we journey together, as we continue our journey together, what is transforming here? What is transfiguring here? And how do we experiment together? That will be my driving question. How are we going to pray together? How do we celebrate the broadness of being community in prayer? In the way we worship? In the way we serve? It's fascinating. I've been, I've been swallowed into a lot of research and readings about transforming communities. Is it true and is it fair? Most people, what they want from their church is spiritual coaching, spiritual direction. How do I grow spiritually? Is it true? Do, is it, do you think it's true? From, from three, this, this research of, of MOVE, 3,000 congregations over a period of 10 years almost were interviewed constantly and etc. etc. And what people thought was important ended up not being, well, important, but not as crucial as spiritual guidance. And of course, energetic sermons. <laughs> I can the place. We want good preaching. <clears throat> if anything, what does it look like for us? How do we ooze that into this community? Because we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity, like in the Transfiguration experience, to really live into that statement I read into the history of St. Mary's. To have a lit cross lighting the neighborhood, being the kingdom of God. So how are you doing? Again, it's not a little, I'm genuinely curious. How are you, how are you doing? Oh, you had my grandfather for a month, so I know that was interesting. <laughs> well, at least, I, but I hope you got to learn something about me, because he raised me. I grew up in that household, and I'm sure he must have told you the story about me having to clean the pool and my children. <laughs> right, Colonel, our dog. But where, where are you? Is that a fair question? Yes. Is everybody okay? <laughs> okay. It's summertime. We have one service and, and know that or at least I would like to hear what's moving in your spirit. What's moving in you? What's Maybe an easier question. What did you what do you hear in the transfiguration? What touches you? Well we, we can spend a lot of time talking about what, what Jesus Jesus identity. Yes. What what really strikes me here is the voice yes. spoke. Now, as a naive cosmologist looking at fourteen billion years. Yes. And, and understanding that creation has a momentum in itself, this voice comes from someplace. Yes. And to to say that it's a, a, a psychological thing that they experience is to deny what's happening. Mm -hmm. To say, well, that's the story that they made up is to deny what this says happened. So if this is the case, then... How many of us and how do we hear the voice of God for us? 
And that's why I was struck by that opening line, he went up to the mountain to pray. Because I'm recognizing more and more, how does my prayer need to change? Is it just about words? Using words? How do we pray? I'm always touched by an old bishop who said, you pray with mind and heart. That's an interesting challenge. How does the voice linger? Because the voice is timeless. Again, from a scientific point of view, I'm just an amateur, but quant Stephen Hawkins calls it quantum fluctuations. For anything to happen in the cosmos, it has to be immaterial, I mean it's not physical, it stands outside of time and space, right? Because there is no time. And it has to be conscious because it thinks, predominantly in the language of mathematics, because that's what quantum mechanics uses. That I call God. But, Thank you. But where does that voice and how do we hear that voice? I, I hear you. I'm with you. Yes. Yes. Dick. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your, thank you for the insight because it gives me a direction. As a jumping off platform, I will share with you some works about prayer, and I'll I'll be sharing with you if you like us on Facebook. There are outlets I can do this, but I'll be sharing you some insights of mentors that I've spent time with about prayer and praying with mind and heart. For some, yes, it's not auditory. I will always remember. Did my grandfather talk about St. Andrew's Church? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He mentioned he was a rector. He was the first person of color at this church. This church's name was St. Andrew's. He was there for a year. This was during apartheid. People were wondering, why is this black priest coming to this old Caucasian church on the slopes of University of Cape Town? Strangely enough, then he became a bishop suffragan after that. He was there for a year. That was a very scary experience for me because that was a time I truly heard my name called. And I thought it was my grandfather calling me. It was my own Samuel experience, but profoundly scary. It brought me to tears. And I even remember this feeling till this day because I was a teenager. 
But literally that power of hearing your name call, like where I got up and I went to him as he was listening to Johnny Mathis reading the Sunday Times with a cup of tea. And I'm like, did you call me? No, I didn't call him. I went to him twice. And those experiences can be very profound. So I would like to journey with you and hear and listen about your experiences of prayer, if you would allow. It is good to be home. Keep praying. Keep doing what you're doing. And it's a gift to be in community. Tembe, tembe, baba, tembe, 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 baba, Move, move, move in this place, God, and you heal yourself.